Hello, everybody. Manassas, I was actually talking to everybody else, but uh, thank you for saying hi. And hi, Chad. <laughs> that, that wasn't for you. It was for the attendees. Oh, it was for the attendees. Okay. Uh, hi, Eric. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Randy. Nice to see you guys all here. Hi, Chad. How are you? Good, buddy. How you doing? Very good. Very good. All right. About to start in a minute. And if you can, just in the question area or the chat pod, please let us know that you can hear us and see us okay. Great. I'm assuming with the highs, that's a good sign that some people can hear us. <laughs> also, there's like 30 people saying that it sounds good, so. Okay, perfect, that's another sign. <laughs> awesome, <Yeah. laughs> sign number two. Okay. Probably the better of the signs. Let me, uh, let, let me start sharing my screen. All right. Can you guys see uh, everything okay here? My webpage? Mm -hmm. All right, the first thing I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention is all of the events that are going on at Maxon right now. Uh, you're for part three or week three of demystifying post-production titles, uh, design and animation, where we're looking at this between Cinema 40 and After Effects. And uh, I am greeted by the presence of the brilliant Thanasis, AKA Noseman. Thanks so much for coming here today, Thanasis. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Unfortunately, you're hosting, but we have to live with some of the, the problems. <laughs> I know, but you you had to actually, you know, work with me for the last week, so that was even more more problematic. I enjoyed, I enjoyed our SMS, uh, our SMSs. Uh, oh, I can even show a list of <laughs> all the nice little memes I made. No, I'm not. <laughs> No, no, the, we, you can put that up in the project files after. Uh, yeah. But but moving on to the the other events, so the 3D Motion Design Show is actually happening this this Wednesday, it looks like. And if you haven't tried a hands-on Maxon session, there's one going on in color grading this month, part three, where they give you access to the project files ahead of time, and you can follow along with the instructors going through a ton of various examples and how to color correct footage through uh, multiple applications. So you should check out that. And one other event at the end of the week here, we've got VFX and Chill with uh, Hashi and Seth, so you can check that as well. Now, all of you guys are also entitled to a free t-shirt. So what I'm gonna do is copy this link from the Shopify page so that everyone can get this here in a second. And the code actually happens to be in all caps 08 titles. So I'll just send that to everybody. And let me just add the actual code if you want a free t-shirt. I I'm, It's mostly free. You actually have to pay for shipping. So that's the one thing to keep in mind. I think it's $4. Old school, old school. if I'm correct. There you, there you go. <laughs> so yes, free, but you gotta pay for shipping. <laughs> we are recording this session. So if you need to check this out after you can head to the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel, and we should have this up by tomorrow afternoon, usually a day after we'll put up the, the session from the day before. So you can check out that. And I just wanted to give, besides this, this is a great resource for 20 second tips, as well as they have webinar uh, snippets that you can check out. But since we're here with the NASA's Noseman, you should totally check out his YouTube page as well. Nose man knows. I've just put it up here and I'm going <laughs> to copy a link here to the chat. It's like in, in case we need to identify him, he's, you know, showed us his his forehead right here, which is fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> now, but I have it closed there. Yeah. For contrast. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Contra. So that that's it for, for the housekeeping and stuff. And uh, I wanted to say also thank you so much for joining me here, Chad. Chad and, uh, and, yeah, and coming to thanks. this week. And You'll be hearing some more from both of us uh, starting in week four and week five, so stay tuned for that. And, and Thanasis, what do we what do we have on on stage for today? Okay, so I think it's time for me to share my screen if I'm not. Uh, which yes, means I wanna, you have to do something first. Yes, I'm gonna have to find you from this large list. Oh, there we go. And now you have control, my friend. Main screen. Show my screen. Excellent. I, I hate it when I rely on you for things, but you know, <laughs> life is not perfect. Um, anyhow, it just brings me uh, joy. It brings me joy when you ask me these for these things. 
I know, I know. I hate to give you joy, Nick. <laughs> but anyway, we're very good friends uh, with Nick. That's why the level of banter is, you know, beyond. Um, yeah, no, when we when we're off air, we actually speak our true emotions. So it's kind of turned down what you see here. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so you can see my screen. It says titles. And what we are going to do today is uh, the following. We are going to create a the setup for this little thing over here. It looks funny. Uh, we're not going to do any rendering uh, in Redshift. This is all uh, pure Cinema 4D. And uh, we're going to start with that little, the, the word titles, and we are going to create a build-up, an animation where these lines start writing on uh, this, uh, whatever title you want it to be. And then at a certain point, it's going to grow some hair. And uh, yeah, we're going to get a hairy title. We're going to emphasize more in the creation of this. And um, the I'll call it the process we're going to use is a hybrid uh, between a procedural setup and a sort of a deterministic, as we call it. So just to, to give you a very quick overview, what um, a, a dynamic or simulated and a, what a deterministic uh, setup is. Uh, in a simulated um, uh, setup, you need to calculate every single frame uh, after each other, uh, and that is to 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 allow the program to know what happened before in order to do what it needs to do next. A typical example of that would be dynamics, because uh, you cannot resolve dynamics if you don't know exactly what happened previously in the previous step, the previous time frame, which is usually a frame. But deterministic means that uh, regardless of what you're doing, you can go to any frame and the calculation will happen based on that time frame. MoGraph is a very good example of a deterministic particle system. So we're going to work in a hybrid way. So I'm going to use some dynamics to create a final state of something. And then I'm going to use deterministic uh, factors to animate uh, that thing. So I hope it's going to be uh, interesting. I am going to share not one file, but I think it's eight files, which are the eight steps uh, I identified. So you can actually have each uh, mini setup isolated, uh, plus the final scene, what you see here, which you can open without any plugins in Cinema 4D and just render it out using standard renderer and uh, the hair rendering system, right? Nothing intricate about this. And next week, we're going to do um, this in Redshift or something else. We we'll decide over the next few days. So let's begin from the very beginning. We have this very simple uh, title, and this is nothing more than a, a text spline with some, um, uh, some sort of typeface here, which you can uh, switch out. And I'm going to use this. This is my the final, let's say, the final setup. And my letters are spread out because the technique I'm going to use uh, doesn't uh, doesn't help if letters are too close to each other because things can jump uh, from uh, letter to letter. But nonetheless, this is going to be how my final title is going to be. So this is going to be the framing. And I want to create those lines that draw on each and every one of the uh, letters. I'm going to use a technique which um, Ellie uh, from the training team showed, I think, a week ago uh, by using a... Um, a volume, uh, a vector volume, but she used particles as far as I remember. I'm going to do this just uh, without using any particles at all, just uh, MoGraph. So let's begin by creating a MoGraph cloner, and I'm going to create a um, simple sphere. I'm going to make it a child and set the cloner to clone, not on a grid array, but on an object. And I'm going to use this extruded text as the object. Now, of course, we have uh, uh, the spheres are too large, although it doesn't make a difference because I'm not going to use the spheres as an element of my graphic. I'm just going to use them to track their motion. So I'm going to make them very small, maybe two centimeters, a very teeny weeny little ones here. And I'm going to tell my cloner to generate 500 of these. Now, the next thing is to go to the sphere and just put this at the smallest level. I don't want to have much geometry. If we go very close, you'll see these are little rhomboids now. So I'm quite happy with this. 
I want these to start walking on the surface of each letter uh, in a way that it only goes on the surface. And I'm going to trace that motion and create a line. So how do we do that? Well, and I'm looking at my notes because there are some numbers I need to be very careful with. Uh, in order to do that, I want to create a, a force, some sort of uh, force that pushes these little um, spheres on over the surface. And uh, I'm going to set these to be dynamic. So right click, simulation tags, rigid body. And if I press play, you'll see that they all fall. I do not want that to happen. So all you have to do is go to your edit, project settings, and in the dynamics tab, set your gravity to zero. So we have no gravity. I don't want any gravity in this uh, simulation. You can see now some of these are flying apart. That's because they happen to intersect. And uh, the first thing that Cinema 4D does is trying to uh, resolve any intersections, but that won't change anything as far as our title is concerned. Now let's go and create that vector field using a volume builder. Now the volume builder has three modes, SDF, sign distance field, fog, and vector. If you go on Cineversity, you'll find tutorials about uh, these modes. If I set it to vector, and I want to put some sort of object in here by making my text a child. And this is the vector volume. Each line, imagine it's a little arrow, a little arrow that can be translated into a force. So depending on where each of these spheres is, that arrow is going to push it outwards because that is the direction of the surface of the object. That's sort of how it gets calculated. And uh, there's an interesting little modifier down here, if you click and hold this, which is called vector curl. And this just uh, rotates that force uh, so that it's, uh, I would say, approximately 90 degrees. It's a very particular mathematical operation. Uh, so you can see now these are sort of lying on the surface. They're going perpendicular to the surface. Excellent. Parallel to the surface, I would say. And we're going to use this as a force. So how do we affect dynamics? We need to go and create from the simulate menu a field force. A field force is a force you can sculpt using uh, fields. But because fields can take uh, any type of object, we are going to grab our volume builder and put it in here. And it asks us, do you want a point object or do you want a volume object? I want a volume object. And uh, there are a couple of things uh, we need to be uh, very careful when we do this. First of all, we need to select this and we need to go to remapping. We need to enable remapping. Let me show you what happens if I don't do that. So you can see that these are starting to move very, very little, not too much. They're just starting to move, but that's not exactly what we want to do. We want, first of all, to make them move in that absolute direction. So set absolute velocity. And this way it will use these little arrows to push these in a predefined way. Now, you, nothing is really happening. And that's because we need to tell this uh, volume builder how the data is gonna be interpreted. And this is a necessary step. Let's go back to remapping, enable the remapping. Let's bring this up. These are steps you just need to do. You do them once, you learn them. Then you go to direction. You need to set the length to be normalized and turn off the invert direction. In this case, it won't make such a huge difference, but now these should start uh, moving around. Look at them. So they're all trying to move in the direction of uh, the closest little uh, line they have to them. Now I'm gonna set this to 50. Rewind, press play, and now you will see that they will move much faster. And if I go and uh, turn this off, the visibility off, so you can see now our little spheres are trying to move on the surface of each letter. Uh, up to this point, it's very similar to what Ellie showed us. Now, how am I gonna go and create those little lines? Well, I'm gonna select the cloner. Let me stop this for a second, rewind. I'm gonna go to the MoGraph menu and create a tracer object. Automatically, because I had the cloner selected, the cloner is going to be uh, populating the trace link. And uh, by definition, the 
tracer traces the vertices of each and every one of these little spheres. So for each one of these, we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six lines. I don't want that. I just want it to trace the centers. So get rid of this. And now we should start getting lines. Excellent. Now there's one more thing which most people miss. If I stop it and go very close, you will see we get these weird jaggies. Look at these little jaggy lines. The reason for that is the way the field force initially reads a volume, if you go to the layer, it uses the nearest point. And because um, a particle may be close to another point, then goes to another point, and then goes close to another point, and these directions change, we need to find a way to smooth this out. The easiest way is to use the linear or the quadrat quadratic interpolation. Now, if I rewind and press play, you will see that the motions are much smoother. Now, the steps I showed you, if you want to create these nice little uh, swirly motions, I would say they are required. So, as far as the line um, is concerned, I'm looking at my notes, um, I think that's all you have to do to create the lines. Now, this would be step one, to generate a bunch of lines. We're not going to animate this motion. We're just going to use this setup to get the final letters that are made out of lines. So I'm going to set my animation uh, range to 90 frames. I'm going to go to my animate and the play mode. I'm just going to say simple. Simple will stop my uh, animation from playing at frame 90 at the last frame. I don't want it to cycle around. I'm going to rewind. Press this a couple of times if it doesn't update. Press play. And we're going to wait a few seconds for all the lines to be drawn. And when it gets to 90, it's going to stop. Perfect. So now we have these little lines here. And how do we, uh, let's say, fix this? How do we freeze that? We go to the tracer, we right click, and we say current state to object. And now we have this spline object over here, which you can copy and paste in a new document. And it's just the lines. So we used dynamics and uh, field force and clones and all that to model something that looks very organic, uh, very interesting, and has the shape of the letters made of lines. We are going to use this, let's call it uh, lines text. We're going to use this to complete our title. So if I go back here and I'm going to grab my actual title and paste it in here so we can have them both because we're going to do something else with this now the question is how do i animate each letter that's made of lines there's not a single way to do it but i have chosen to do it uh in a very specific way which you can refactor to do all sorts of other animations first of all and let's forget about the lines for a second I turn off anything that happens to um, be distracting. I'm going to create an animation for these, uh, for the title sequence. And in order to bring any model, any um, pre-made model into the MoGraph context, you need to create a fracture object and make this a child. The fracture object uh, doesn't really fracture things in that uh, sense. It just brings other objects, anything you put as children, you, it brings it in so it can be controlled by MoGraph. That's pretty much what it does. For me, in order to break up all these individual letters, I need to set the mode to explode segments. Now, the explode segments and connect will do exactly the same thing. The and connect is a residual from older versions of Cinema 4D when the caps of an extrude were separate objects and we wanted them to be welded on the rest of the letter, otherwise the caps would just fly away by them uh, themselves. But now this or that, explode segments or explode segments and connect for text, extruded text, it's exactly the same thing. Because now it's a MoGraph object, I can use effectors to uh, animate it. So let's say we want our animation to be 180 frames and uh, six seconds. And what I'm going to do is with the fracture object selected, I'm gonna to go to MoGraph, and bring up a step effector because I want to control each letter individually. You will see that now 
each letter gets a different scale. The step effector um, distributes whatever the value of the effector is on each component of whatever MoGraph setup you have from zero of that to the maximum of that. So this letter is double the original size, this letter is the original size, and everything between scales. I don't want to scale this. What I want to do is move these so I can bring them closer to each other. Now there's one little obvious problem here that they don't meet in the center. They're sort of a left uh, justified. And that's because it's the step effect starts counting from here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. There is a way to make this meet in the middle. It requires us to go to the effector and tell the effector to have a minimum influence of minus 100 and a maximum influence of 100. So it will take whatever value we put here and it will distribute it over the minimum and the maximum. But because it, this is balanced, the, the median between 100 and minus 100 is zero, whereas the median between zero and 100 is 50. That's why we have this difference. And you can use this trick with uh, any uh, effector for that matter. So we're changing the, the value distribution for this uh, particular effector. So now, by modifying this parameter, I can go and create any kind of uh, animation I wish. So I think what I did earlier, and uh, I don't even remember exactly, I think it was, um, we'll, we'll find out what the animation is gonna be later on, or, oh yeah, I have it here. So from frame five to 150 goes from zero to, right, from frame five, let's add a keyframe here. Let's go to 150 and let's make this minus 50. There you go. That's all the animation we're gonna do to the text. That was it, just tighten them up. Now, we've got this animation. I want to transfer this animation, which I'm happy can be much more complex and you can do rotations and all that, to the lines. And the way I'm going to do this is by using a deformer. And the deformer I'm going to use is the surface deformer. I'm going to tell the lines to go and project themselves on the text. But in order to do that, we cannot use a, a MoGraph object. We need to consolidate this into a mesh object. And the way to do that is to use a connect object. So create a connect object, make this a child, tell the connect object not to weld anything, just in case, because welding sometimes, if two points come too close, it will weld them and it will change the count of our polygons. So the animation still remains, but because this gives us a mesh object, I can tell the surface to project by pressing initialize on the actual text. Now let's go and turn off the text and see how the splines react. And you can see now that the animation has been transferred to the text. And you can do this with any sort of animated uh, model. Um, I have some examples where I have an animated uh, T-Rex and there's some splines on it. And you, you can apply this to a wide range of uh, effects. Excellent. So let's see where we are here. Um, so I've got my animation ready. I've got everything working nicely. And I think at this point, let's go and add some camera animation so we have a general overview of what we are trying to do here. So I'm going to create a camera and uh, I'm going to create a null because the animation I'm trying to do is going to be a rotation of the camera, sort of a, a dolly the camera uh, around this pivot. Imagine if you have a sort of a, a large crane and, or something like that. I want to bring the camera to be the the actual camera of the scene, I'm going to zero out all my attributes just by clicking on the reset transform. And I'm going to go to my camera and pull back on the Z. Good. I have um, I think that for what I'm trying to do, an 80 millimeter lens is going to be ideal because I don't want too much perspective. I'm going to frame this and make sure that, you know, it's pretty much in the middle because the text is lying on the floor. And let's assume that this is the framing I need. If you want to turn on the composition so you can see this in a grid or triangles or other fancy stuff, golden sections and so forth, you can go ahead and but do that. But Yes. I was actually asking in, in previous weeks a few people if they um, use those composition 
tabs with the camera often. And the response from two people was no, but I was curious in your work, do you find yourself using the uh, composition helpers with your camera? Oh yes, all the time, because it, it okay. simplifies, yeah, it, it takes the guesswork away from seeing if something is uh, centered and so forth, especially if you have various graphic elements that can obscure your view or put some visual weight on something. When you have objects which are sort of biased on, on one side, the, the composition may lose um, its, its sense of balance, okay? Uh, this sort of makes it seem that it's, the S is tighter on this side because there's something next to it. Uh, if you want your title to literally be in the center, these kind of visual uh, distractions are not going to help you. So by going to the camera and turning on any of these uh, helpers, and you can always go and change the number, you can do all sorts of things, you, you can be quite sure that whatever you're making is properly aligned, and uh, you don't you don't have to use your thumb on the screen or uh, rulers and all that or uh, I would say uh, post-it notes on your screen. Not that it's not a viable method, but it allows you to keep your screen uh, free from uh, any sticky material and glue. Right. So yes, I use them and they're very handy. Now uh, let's get back to this. We have a null. It's in the center of the world. I'm going to call this camera animator. And I'm going to make the camera a child of that so that I can take this null and rotate. And you can see that I'm rotating, rotating exactly as if I had some sort of crane or uh, some sort of uh, nice little rig made here. And uh, I like to create <clears throat> multiple uh, rigs with multiple nulls when I want to do complex camera animation. You can get away with um, all sorts of things like uh, controlling your order of rotation and so forth. But I like to think if you do have a camera and you want to do a particular type of motion in, in real life, you will build a rig. You will uh, put down dolly tracks, you will uh, get a crane, you will do anything that's necessary. And believe me, adding nulls is much more intuitive to try and replicate what you will do in the real world. And at the same time, it's easier than carrying uh, very heavy rails or cranes and much cheaper. You can make as many nulls as you want and you won't be charged extra. So just making that clear. So what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to create a bit of an animation on this null. Uh, I think that I was around minus 60 degrees. Uh, at frame zero, and then I'm going to go to frame 150, and I'm going to go to zero here. So this is pretty much the animation of my text. This is all it's going to do. Just go around, and this is my final frame. Excellent. So um, let's uh, proceed. What is my next step? I want these lines, I want these lines to draw on my screen. So I want them to start from nothing and then slowly start appearing here as lines. But I have the final version of these lines and I want to find a way to use some sort of object that will allow me to draw these lines on. And uh, that object will be our fantastic most blind. One of the modes of the most blind, it has uh, about three gazillion modes, is uh, it's three modes, but you can do many things with them. You go to spline mode, so object tab, mode, spline mode, and you go to the spline tab and you say, I want to reference this particular spline. Now, let me go and make that spline invisible. So what we're seeing here is the most spline itself. I'm going to deactivate the camera so I can go close here and you see this, this blue thing. Um, the gradient shows you the direction of the spline and it's thickness, right? I don't care about that. So go to the mode spline and go to object and say display mode, just the line. I don't want to see the thickness. And in the object tab, we have this little start and end and we can draw splines on and off. Now, in complete spline, it will start drawing uh, the segments one by one completely. So first one, then the other, then the other, then the other. I don't want to do that. I want each segment to start at the same time. So go to separate segments and watch this now. Whoop. We're drawing the splines on, which I find very interesting. So let's go to frame zero 
and set the end mode to zero. So there's nothing drawn. And um, let me see where which frame did I choose to to do that. Uh, we'll find out soon enough. Let's go to 150. I'm good with that. Let's go here and do that. And then. Hey, Thanasis. Yes, please. Am I allowed to interrupt and ask you a question? Oh, you you have to. You have okay. to. Okay. Part of the rule. Yeah. So, so most blind, it went into because the, the lines text object that's already converted. It's just like polygons, right? And how did most spline understand that those were splines, like, and know what to do? That was that's amazing. Uh, lines, uh, the, the lines are not polygons; they're lines. They're just splines. So, uh, quick, um, most spline one one, draw a spline. You're done with the spline. Get a most spline object. Hide the original spline. S tell the most spline object to use the spline mode and tell it which spline you want to use. I want to use the spline. So what you're seeing here is a direct representation of this spline, but through a most spline. And because most spline oh. adds, can, can play with that data and do all sorts of fancy things, you can change its uh, thickness, you can change its tapering, you can use this data in a um, sweep object, and I'm going to add a circle to the sweep, and then I'm going to add the most spline as the path, and I can make the the circle as big as I want. It doesn't change because the thickness is uh, is actually driven by the most spline itself. Most and here's line. the great okay. thing: the most spline you can use effectors to change the parameters, which means if I tell this spline to scale up in a certain direction using a field, I can use that field to thicken up my spline because my, my most spline is not only a spline, but it's a spline that obeys the MoGraph rules. It's, mm. it's just uh, the most spline is one of the most powerful and amazing tools when it comes to playing around with splines. You will see it in quite a few of my presentations uh, I've done over uh, the last year uh, for the 3D Motion Show, the Jellyfish and all that, where I'm using it extensively. And you can I'll, even... Uh, I'll post that tutorial just in the links, uh, the Jellyfish, because I think it's up on the, the Maxon site. And uh, just to let you know, a lot of people are loving this most blind tip, uh, Thanasis. So this is something that uh, people would even love to see more of as a side note. Oh, is yeah. it that you haven't watched my tutorials, I would guess? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> noted, noted. Ah, you just outed yourselves. <laughs> okay, just follow me. I'm full of surprises and, <laughs> and kind words. So uh, there was something else. Oh, yeah, the final thing you can do with a most blind, which is, again, another totally different thing, is that you can take a most blind. Now, this spline here is adaptive and all that, Bezier. You can take the most blind and tell it, you know something, uh, I don't want uh, the same vertices. I want to have a particular number of segments that make up this spline. Oh. I want to make up this spline from 10 segments. I want to make up this spline with uh, 16 segments. And then you can use this spline to clone things on it. I can say, I want a matrix object, and I want it in object mode, and I want it in this spline, and I want to put my objects on the vertices. And now my vertices are controlled by the number of segments I have here. So there's so much control you, you can exert in the MoGraph, and not only uh, modeling or all sorts of things using uh, most blinds. It's it's one of those things where it it's a, bot, a bottomless pit of interesting things you can do. Uh, it can even do uh, L systems and grow trees. And uh, if anyone's into oh. L systems, I can yes. give you circle mode and you go here and add some rules. And then what? And grow yeah, yeah, it's a full uh, L system thing. Go to the help. I have a suggestion. Why don't you right click and go to the help? How about that as a tip? Go to help and check out the rules. So this is a proper L system, um, and you can yeah grow trees. Or well, that's amazing. It is. So let's go back. Right. Um, where were we? I, I lose my train of thought very easily. I'm like sorry for the detour, but thank you so much for that. No, that no, was I'm up to do very that. illuminating. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so where are we? So we are at the animation stage, and now this is growing, okay? And what is growing is a spline. So let me show you, I'll, I'll show it to you later because I want to surprise you again. So let's assume that I'm okay with my animation. Uh, I've got everything framed and timed nicely, and I'm happy with exactly what's going on. You can see the text, uh, those final little frames is, is uh, sort of coming closer. Is it coming closer? I didn't forget anything. Yeah, there you go. The, the text is coming closer. You can see it clearly. It's very discreet, just like my art, very discreet. My art is so discreet, and I think it's because I don't do art. That's how discreet it is. It doesn't exist. Right. That's the the epitome of discretion is when something doesn't exist. That's how imperceptible it is. So there we go. Now, what I want to add to this uh, so that we create sort of this effect here is uh, we want to generate a bunch of uh, splines again, uh, but we want to generate these splines on our splines. So how do we do that? Well, if we select the most spline and go and add hair. So let's go simulate and let's go and add hair. Let's uh, get rid of this camera. Let's go and see what happened here. Look at all this hair. We have loads of hair. Now, when it comes to, to hair and when you want to create uh, something with not so much density, you select the hair object and you can see in the guides, the hair is another very complex, very deep and very interesting part of Cinema 4D and it can generate splines as well. Don't, don't think of hair just as, you know, what I don't have under my hood, but think of hair as strands, which you can do things like ropes or, um, you know, things, branches and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do uh, is, uh, first of all, let me go and create not 44,993 of these hairs, but 1,500. Then I'm going to set the length to 300. And then I'm going to go to the growth. And instead of growing in the, so to speak, normal direction, I'm going to grow in a random direction. And if it doesn't update, just press A a couple of times or rewind. Let's go back here. Ah, that's why I didn't do the growing earlier. So what I'm going to do here, just to make sure uh, I, I don't have to rewind all the time. So let me do something over here. Uh, because the hair is growing, you can see that the hair is growing and it's trying to grow on something which is growing itself. We're going to have a bit of an issue now because the hair is trying to grow on the most spline and the most spline is growing. So I'm not going to tie the hair to the most spline. I'm going to tie it to the final hairs. Okay, so let's, let me tell you exactly what to do from right off the bat. So let's go here, select the lines text and go and grow the hair. Because the lines text is a stable spline, whereas the most spline is a growing spline. And if the growing spline is changing variables and adding points and growing, then the hair has to adapt with each frame. But I don't want to do that. So go back to the hair, make this 1500, make the length 300. That was in my notes, I just didn't read it. And let's go to the growth normals and set this to random direction. And let's go here. And the other thing we need to do is make sure that uh, we are generating splines. Before I set this to spline, I need to go to uh, hair roots because now it's gonna create 50,000 hairs. I want it to create hairs exactly where the guides are. So hairs, roots, as guides. And now each hair is going to be a guide. And uh, let me go back. All right, everything is falling down. Guides, random. That's interesting. The random direction is not working right now. Excellent. So I'll see how I'm going to fix that. That should update properly. Anyway, let me see what happens. Generate, go to generate with a hair and generate splines. I want to generate splines. And if I deselect that, you can actually see the splines. Good. Now, I'm very curious as to why it's not doing my little random thing over here. 
because I am pretty sure, and just to make sure, always refer to your final file. That's why we do these. Hair guides random. Interesting. Spline vertex, just checking my parameters. Everything seems to be okay. Yep, as guides. So let's go back to that file and we'll find the solution eventually. So hair guides random. And let's try old spline vertex. If you see anything different than what I had, I'm just trying some other parameters. And then uh, Sean had a question, and I was wondering this as well. I, um, in, in the previous project, you it turned off gravity. And yes. um, in this project, it yep. looks like the hair is falling. Is that uh, no, because no, no. of right. gravity? Let me stop you right there. Uh, Cinema 4D, I think, has six different particles, uh, six, six different dynamic systems. We have uh, cloth dynamics, we have hair dynamics, uh, which works with spline dynamics. We have uh, soft body dynamics, we have rigid body dynamics, we have uh, rudimentary dynamics inside a standard particle system and our uh, thinking particle system. And uh, then we have mini dynamics in uh, the, the jiggle deformer and other components. These are all unrelated. The dynamics I turned off earlier was the rigid body dynamics uh, which we control uh, through this gravity. This doesn't have any any uh, relationship with the hair. Mm -hmm. So you can see no gravity for our rigid body dynamics. The hair dynamics, you go to the hair object and for each object you have a different dynamic system. You go to dynamics uh, mm -hmm. or forces and you get rid of the gravity. Now, some people may think this is it does sound a bit uh, complicated, but the good thing is that you can make multiple hair systems with different amounts of gravity to create different types of effects, or you can use forces from here. These forces, funny enough, uh, work with pretty much every single one of our dynamic systems. So uh, there's a sort of a common ground where I can add gravity, which will affect everything, including hair and cloth, and everything else if I add it through uh, one of these forces. Mm. Now, so yeah, uh, it, it's independent, uh, but I did turn off gravity now and you can see that, there you go. Now I'm still um, a bit, yeah, I do not know why the randomness uh, doesn't uh, work in this particular case. So uh, that is odd. I am gonna do it one more time because I'm pretty certain that uh, this uh, would work, did work every single time I did it. So let's go here, let's get the hair, let's um, select the hair, let's make this 1500, let's make this 300, let's set this to random, and it's not doing me any favors. So roots set as guys. There was um, a few suggestions. One was uh, try the hair. The, the hair segments are different, but that could explain the random not working. Try That's regrowing. 16. No, no, uh, it's 16. It works. Uh, the 16 is to make it a bit curlier, basically. So okay. that wasn't it. Thank you. And for the this. other was guide editing regrow. That this these were in the chat. Yes, the regrow. Guides was... editing regrow. Yep. Let's try that. That is the next thing. There you go. So it did need the regrow. So let me explain why I think this happened, all right? Because I originally created the hairs, I think, with the most spline, it may have put the whole hair system into some sort of, uh, you know, um, where are we growing things on and, and so forth. So although I was growing the hair from a, a new set of uh, splines, internally it, it kept some sort of uh, data linked to it, but the regrow was uh, the way to go. So thank you very much for bringing me out of this uh, loop. Now, let me show you what you can do with hair. And don't forget, we are generating uh, splines, right? So we're generating splines. Uh, each spline is generated exactly like the guide. So we're not gonna get, if I render this, we are not gonna get any intermediate uh, weird uh, hairs going on. And uh, I want to find a way to affect these splines by using uh, our uh, materials, our hair materials. So these are the previous ones. If you go to the actual hair material, 
some of these parameters have nothing to do with uh, rendering and they have everything to do with the shape especially if you're generating splines so i can say i want to frizz and kink these i want to bend curl and twist these and once you update this look at that you get hair which becomes much more interesting and i have some specific parameters here which i wrote down which makes things um quite interesting so I think the curl, I put it as 720, and let's advance by one and rewind. There you go. And you get this beautiful little curling. And I'm not referring to that odd game where you push things on the ice and people are sweeping the ice and being like, ah, hey, hey. It's a, a big thing here in Canada and Scotland, as far as I know. So uh, curling. Uh, not that curling. So you can play around with the parameters for bend, curl, and twist. And although it's applied as a material, it does change the geometry of uh, these splines here. Okay. So I've created these wonderful little splines. Like, let's go back to my camera. And you can see the other splines are growing. These seem to be uh, relatively uh, fixed. And you can add some of the uh, forces you wish. You can see that there, because they are following the animation of the lines, they're waving as well. Let's go to the top view and see exactly what's going on. Because the letters are moving, they're sort of coming closer. You can see some of that, um, some of those dynamics are propagating in the, the motion of uh, the hair. So let's go back to our 3D view. And uh, I want to do that trick I did earlier with the, the most blind growth by using the hairs, because although I want them to be in this final state, I want to be able to grow them after my initial lines, the text lines have been created. So I'm gonna do exactly, so I'm gonna call this text lines, that's the previous uh, most blind. I'm gonna create a new most blind. So here's a most blind. I'm gonna call this hair, Mo spline, and I'm going to tell. I'm going to let's turn these off. Tell the hair mo spline to receive a spline. That spline needs to be the hair, and because it's generating splines, it will read it. There you go. I'm going to turn off my uh, uh, preview, and I can go again to my separate segments, and I can animate this as well. So let's go and find a nice little frame where. Uh, we can see our, uh, our text, let's say 120. So let's go to frame 120. Let's set this to zero. Let's add a keyframe and let's go to frame 100. Yeah, you know what I'm gonna do? Right, let me show you a couple of ways how to change the keyframe because that's uh, valuable information. You can either just go and click here and this in the attributes manager will give you um, information about the interpolation of the keyframe and so forth. Uh, or you can go to your parameter and you can right click and you can say animation uh, show uh, you can show the track you can show the f curve uh, anything that's convenient for you and then here you can go and select the keyframe this is the keyframe 120 and you can change the value so if i want my growth to start earlier let's say 100 you can just do it here you don't need to move this around and all that you can just type the number and let's go to frame 170 and finalize our growth. We even have the key value here, but I'm gonna go and do it over here. I'm gonna finalize it to 100%, add the keyframe, and now I can play the whole animation. So let's rewind, let's turn off my original spline, so only the animated ones are gonna come. So we can see nothing. You're gonna start, you can see the little dots appearing, hopefully the resolution allows you to do that. The dots are appearing, the splines are getting, longer and longer and uh, this is calculating real time i'm working on my mac pro 5 coma 1 uh, i bought it new in 2010 and uh, that's how good it's the best computer ever made if uh, i mean everyone is going to agree with me even if you disagree you disagree because you're envious so let's wait for the hair to start growing. It's going to start growing now. There you go. It's growing. And it's not growing dynamically. That's the great thing about it. It's th This is the deterministic part. The dynamic part is how these are waving. 
but the growth itself is uh, deterministic, which makes your animation much more stable. And you can go and save this as an Alembic file and all that. Excellent. So I'm going to stop this right here. And I'm going to do the final thing, which is render this using hair. Now, this material here, the hair material, which I've used on this hair, I've used it to create the modeling aspect of it with the curls and all that. If I apply it to my hair most blind, it may go there and add more of that. I don't want to do that. I'm going to go and create a new material, a new hair mat material, uh, excuse me, uh, a new hair material. I'm going to call this final render hair and I'm going to put it on the most blind and I'm going to put it on my text lines. And let's see if I render this, what's going to happen. And I get this. Let's go and do some uh, minor um, uh, adjustments in terms of uh, lighting and all that and colorization. The default color of hair is this. I want to make something a bit more uh, saturated, a bit more, let's say, looks a bit more gold or something like that. And um, I, I like the specularity it has and make it a bit more saturated over there. And let's make this a bit lighter. And let's do a quick render. And you can see that um, it renders fairly quickly. Uh, there you go, nice and red. I know you're not going to like it, but anyhow. So the final thing, when you're, when you're rendering hair, again, we're going to render this using Redshift um, uh, next week, or I'll let you render it the way you want it. But when you're using Cinema 4D's um, standard or physical render to render hair, um, it's good to add a light that has some soft shadows and go here, increase the resolution. Let's go 1500 by 1500. Let's go to this and pull it out of the way. Just bring it here and raise it up a bit. And you get this render like this. You get a bit of shadowing. And of course I can go and uh, make some of these hairs thicker. So let me do that as a final thing. I'm going to make a copy of this hair material. Call this thick. Uh, take the thick hair, put it on my most line. I want that hair to be a bit darker and a bit thicker, and it will taper out. You can see that the tips are thinner. You can play with that or make it uh, uh, using this curve, make it thin on both sides. It, you can do all sorts of interesting things. And let's go to the thin ones and just go and make them thinner overall. So half the thickness. And this now, hopefully, is going to look ever so slightly, there you go. So we have a more defined uh, text. Uh, you can even change the color, make it green. Uh, I know you know that. Uh, I'm just trying to make it a bit more fancy because people think I'm an artist and uh, I'm not, but that's uh, a different discussion. There you go. Green and uh, uh, candy cane, whatever it's called, sort of candy colored uh, hair. And um, I think that this concludes the technique, how to use hybrid dynamic and deterministic methods in order to build something which has uh, an enormous amount of complexity in um, it looks very organic and natural and fuzzy and cute or whatnot. But at the same time, uh, you have 100% control and uh, you can art direct it, uh, the how long it's going to take for these to grow, how long you want them to be. I may choose to say, you know something, I don't want these to grow uh, fully. I want them to be half the size because my creative director thought that would be a good idea. Now, most creative directors their ideas are uh, how many creative directors are on the uh, attendee list today i don't want to alienate everyone but if it's a couple then you know uh, i have a few things to say about creative directors our directors on the other side are my favorite people so let's see this and uh, i think we are on perfect time to receive some questions doobie doobie thank doobie. you uh, for for that thanasis and then just a question about the project files again, you yes. said there were eight, right? That are breaking down the steps that you went through, which we'll put no, up so on yeah, Dropbox. Just give you, yeah, because the, the reason I did it that way is because 
half the process is uh, uh, dynamic and the other half is uh, deterministic. I, I want you to be able to have uh, the versions, how it started, the simple text, uh, how it was grown and all that. So you can, uh, watching the video, you have those files as well and you can check out the numbers and all that. So yeah, it's just the evolution of the file. So now I've changed the number, the, the length, uh, where I'm growing this, where I'm growing the, the extra hair, and we get something uh, different. So, um, the, the, I'm going to leave my screen in case we have a question where I need to show something. Sure. Um, there, there was actually a random question just in regards to the Cinema 4D uh, interface from Aaron here, which I wanted to mention. So, he was just looking for a way to enlarge the UI elements in Cinema 4D for a 4K display. Mm -hmm. and was finding on his, that it doesn't seem to honor his uh, Windows native scaling features. Get a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's uh, there's something about Windows and scaling and all that. I, I, I don't understand that stuff. I'm very, I'm very simple when it comes to computers. I refuse to learn anything that was made yeah. by a billion dollar company and doesn't work perfectly, which is everything, <laughs> uh, except for Cinema 4D. So, <clears throat> what I'd like to say is that if you want to just make things look larger, the manual thing is to right-click in inside one of the palettes or the object manager and just go to uh, icon size and put the larger size. If the operating system is not doing it properly, I would say open a ticket with Maxon because maybe there's some some sort of um, uh, system plugin you've got or something like that. But I I don't um, fully understand how. Windows works with these uh, things, so I apologize, I, but I don't really apologize. You understand? There's a fine balance. <laughs> I have you a have question. A, oh, yeah, go for it, Chad. Sorry, uh, you mentioned that uh, in passing that you can export these, uh, this whole thing to like Alembic. So is there, I'm guessing there's a way to convert these like hair things to polygons, even if the material is generating the shapes? Do you come from Maya? No, uh, kind of a yeah, little why bit. Are you them polygons. I don't know why I'm calling them polygons. I know better than that. Uh, so vertices, <laughs> vertices. <laughs> no, they're not vertices. Okay, so uh, these, if you, if I export anything that's a spline um, as a lembic, it actually becomes uh, the, the alembic curves, right? So it, they will come in as splines. Mm. Let's do that. I can go uh, and get the final hair here, and uh, just. Right click, right click here and say, uh, Baker's Alembic. And it's gonna ask, ooh, let me pull this out of here because I don't know if, oh, that's interesting. So the webinar is right in front of everything. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's go. And oh yeah, it's because I haven't saved this. Okay. Right, it's exporting Alembic, there it is. Doobie doobie. So is there a way to convert things to like uh, points, vertices? What exactly do you want to do? With like if I, so I basically, is there a way to take the hair stuff and mm -hmm. convert it into like editable splines? Yeah, you just uh, make it editable. Yeah, you, I just press C. Uh, one sec, let me, let's uh, allow this to finish. It's going to be done before the top of the arrow, don't worry. It's saving everything uh, in this um, hair system, like 1,500 hairs and their dynamics and all that. But as an Alembic file, uh, it, it's a typical Alembic. You can open this. Any software that supports uh, Alembic curves uh, can open this. So you're going to have those fuzzy hairs uh, uh, doing whatever you want them to do. In terms of making them editable, if you bake them down, you make them editable, well, they don't have the motion anymore, right? Because now they're editable. But as as long as you use them in Cinema 4D, this hair object, okay, here, so here's the here's the hair. If I cut this and go and paste it in a new uh, document, there you go. So this is now the Alembic file. Wow. Okay, now if I make it editable, if I press C and make it editable and C again, now this is a spline. Wow, okay, yeah, that's my question. Oh, there you wow. go. Wow. Ooh. Look at that, just on time. Sorry, I blew it. I <laughs> it ruined was, everything it with was, my question. No, 
it was like one minute to go. It's like the, it's Cinema 4D just knew on your system, Thanasis, so you have other things to do today. <laughs> you, you. Uh, there was yeah. there was actually one really good comment here from from Sean, um, and I wanted to give some background. He's, so the, his question was, you know, beyond doing a title for Alf or Harry of the Hendersons, like not actually hair use cases, like what would be a few other use cases for this? And I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, the inspiration for this title actually comes from the show C that's on uh, Apple TV. Uh, if you take a look at it, you can see some of the the design uh, that's that's there. But I was curious uh, from you in this, uh, I guess, in a procedural front, the NASA's, what other use cases uh, could you use this example for? Uh, but what was that the title you you sent me the other day? C was the uh, the title. Yeah, so that doesn't, it, they don't look like hair, they look like um, ropes and strands and, and all that. Yeah. Look, anything that has any long things, these could be, uh, you know, the thin strands of um, uh, jellyfish, the extra ones. It can be um, uh, vines. So you can create a, a setup with dynamics, just like I did, but instead of following text around, you can use wind objects or attractor objects to, to make these go upwards and make a little vine going around uh, covering something else. It, it's just up to uh, any kind of uh, creative interpretation. You know, uh, the great thing about the hair system is that, and th this is sort of what Cinema 4D, uh, one of the things Cinema 4D is very uh, famous for is that number one, you can do the same thing in many different ways. So it, it, Cinema 4D adapts to the way someone thinks and someone creates and the second thing is that uh, you can abuse most of the stuff uh, most of the tools in cinema 4d it's called hair but it doesn't mean that you're confined uh, only to to doing hairs and grooms and, and all that kind of stuff and um, you know what what i want to uh, advise people is uh, go search for all those you know those rabbit holes for each and every one of the tools, you will you will realize at a certain uh, point that you have been making a living by knowing less than 10% of what each and every one of these tools does. That number one speaks for people's uh, artistry uh, and uh, you know how people can use the tools. Number two, it, it it speaks how capable Cinema 4D is because you don't need to know everything about it to do something which is really impressive and really beautiful and you know really nice but once you start understanding you don't need to geek out too much there's that very small sort of um, i would say shallow learning curve to 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 make the the leap to the next level that suddenly opens uh, enormous amounts of of uh, capabilities and stuff you can do just by repurposing uh the same stuff in slightly different ways you know um the, the, cool. the, yeah the, there's no specific technique uh or specific outcome to use this anywhere you want strands uh hair uh seaweed oh, i remember with um uh, brandon parvini once he, he did uh, some seaweed or something like that um using hair because you can go hair on hair and then you can clone objects on hair. So the, the hair system, before even MoGraph was created, could actually not only clone on each hair, it can deform a mesh object on each and every one of the hairs. And you can, and because you can grow a hair on a hair, you can make a system with three hair uh, systems. You start with uh, three splines, you grow three hairs. On those hairs, you grow leaves. And each and every one of the leaves, you grow spines or something like that. And everything is can be dynamic, and it's relatively cheap. It's a very fast. Uh, it does a lot of cheats when it does its dynamics. Uh, it doesn't have very accurate collisions, but it's very good for these organic shapes. Yeah, you can do kelp forest, a kelp forest with with branches and all that. Yeah, it's um, yeah up to anyone's creative interpretation. If there are any specific things, what I like to do is uh, you know hit me up on uh, Twitter, NosemanGR, and uh, a lot of users send me, ask me questions, or send me a simplified scene, uh, and uh, many times I find that it's, you know, if there's a tutorial or something like that, I would, I would really like people first to look for tutorials. Uh, don't 
you know, it, it's very hard. Uh, it's a hard job to stop what you're doing, open a file, try and find a solution and all that. But I'm willing to do that if people are genuinely in a jam, if you have a problem. Uh, DM me or ask even publicly on Twitter because a lot of people that follow me are very good at Cinema 4D and you probably get an answer. It could be a simple reply. But if you're really in a jam, just DM me. Uh, and if I do have time, I will reply. If I don't, I will just tell you. So I'm very, I'm too honest. Um, but, you know, if there's a particular situation where it, it requires um, uh, a specific solution that's a bit more complex, uh, usually I will you know, take that, put it in my to-do tutorial repository as well. And some of the tutorials I've done were actually based on users' questions. Because something you will ask as a user will be more relevant to the, the user base than something I will come up with in order to, to do something. So this whole hairy thing I did today was inspired when Nick showed me that title sequence and I just took, it, took that and just did something uh, that was adjacent but can be used for that purpose. So uh, your suggestions and your questions always feed the tutorial, let's say, uh, chain. And uh, yeah, we're five minutes past. Good, I managed to do that. But Vanessa, <laughs> I, I wanted to thank you so much for sharing uh, this example and, and taking us through it and then also offering the the project files. That's that's great. And as well as a resource to reach you out on, on Twitter for my next uh, deadline, which happens to be in about 10 minutes. So <laughs> you're blocked. I, oh yeah, I forgot about that, no, no, that whole no, no, thing. No. He did block me. No, no. <laughs> You're just muted. Worse, <laughs> even worse than that. You think I'm listening, but I'm not. That's I know, I know. <laughs> um, just a, a few things sharing my screen. We'll have this this actual whole recording after for you to watch uh, within the next day on the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. Don't forget about the other events that I mentioned earlier today that are happening this week. We got the Motion Design Show, a introductory introduction to color grading hands-on that's kind of like my favorite series here in terms of just being able to play and follow along with project files that you can download before the sessions start and finally Thanasis is this your your YouTube page yes, so for that I do, I do exist as Noseman as well but that is yeah. <clears throat> the old channel uh, by name Athanasios ah. I did it that way just to make people work for it it's the, if you type Noseman it's easy you have to type Athanasios space Posances, right? Or just copy I, the link that Nick just gave you. It did take me a few seconds to find this, so I appreciate the the work. And uh, <laughs> just wanted to to mention, oh, thank you so much for for sharing that uh, with us today. Yeah, and, thanks. Uh, that, that, that was really really incredible. That was. And fantastic. you're back next week too, which is I'm awesome. Back next week for for uh, a brief amount of time. Uh, my website is noseman.org. If you type noseman in Google, I come up first. So there are no excuses, and I have links to all my social media. And I have um, a form. If you want to contact me personally, you just write something in the form, and uh, I'll pretend I've never received it if I don't want to reply. See? That's how you do it. <laughs> awesome, man. So the files are going to be available later today. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, the link is posted, um, I think, uh, yeah from Nick. I added you to the Dropbox so you could just post them up there, Thanasis. Okay, uh, I'll put okay. them all in a single zip file and uh, it's going to have eight files in it and uh, yeah, I'm going to make the, the only thing I'm going to do is the text, just in case you don't have the, the font file, I'm going to make it editable. So it's just going to be a, a text spline, not a, a typeface. That's the only difference. Awesome. Cool. All right, thank you so much, everybody. I'm so glad that uh, for all of those nice comments, I would say the ones uh, for Thanasis, but he already has enough of a, an ego going on. He's good. No, 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 but no. people, people enough. really enjoyed. There was my favorite comment was uh, was you should be Siri at the beginning, and um, and uh, that was it. Thanasis should be the new Siri. That's so cool. That's Keep those compliments coming. Don't listen yes. to this. But <laughs> lots of thanks and and lots of uh, knowledge being shared. So thanks so much. Awesome. Have a great week, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks care, so buddy. much to Chad. Bye, Bye, Chad. See you, buddy. No, no, Bye, everybody. Bye, Chad. <laughs> See you, <in> the asses. <laughs> and the other one. <laughs> Bye, everybody.